let me show you this off. Do you guys like Wildstorm Productions? Do you guys like issue ones? Do you like reading orders? That's what I'm trying to put together. Oh, and a little bit of the history of Wildstorm Productions. That's what I'm trying to put together for this video today. Let's get into it. Are you new to Wildstorm Productions? Would you like to know a potential reading order of what is most important? to Wildstorm Productions, the 90s publishing powerhouse by the one and great Jim Lee. Well, that's the topic of today's episode. I threw this one together. I had another video ready to go today and, and, and lightning struck my brain and I thought this one was more timely and more relevant based on the playlist and the flow of the videos of Wildstorm Productions on this channel. So guys, if you like 90s comics, if you like Philadelphia, PA, if you're if you're hoping that the Eagles don't tank the entire season because we're well, we're not sure what they're doing on the field all the time. But then again, eh, we're not there on the field. So how do we know? Guys, Wildstorm Productions, potential reading order of significant issue ones. Let's go. And there she is. Now Previously on this channel, we got into Jim Lee issue ones. I'm extending that because it just, it got me thinking and I'm excited to do this because a video like this has somewhat, it's been festering for a little bit. I think the timing's right for it. So before Wildstorm Productions, Jim Lee was, he was a Punisher guy and he and Carl Potts, they do a dual origin of the Punisher. The bottom panels is the past. The top is a story that sets him more on his path. You know, and we basically wrap everything with two separate directions. It's fantastic, right? So, to success of Punisher leads to, you guys guessed it, X-Men. Number one, some might say <laughs> the highest selling comic book of all time, 8 million sold. Well, uh, if you if we look at SKUs, if we look at SKUs alone, uh, there's a couple different editions of this that they roll into that number. So, all the money from, from X-Men number one flows into Homage Studios. Now, Image Comics gets formed. Jim Lee and Mark Silvestri, they break away. They get some wonderful office space in California. And it's all systems are go. Now, while uh, Homage Studios did exist prior to X-Men number one. But we're rolling in money here. So, what do we do? This is highly important. And I know so many of you guys have this. The swimsuit issue one is a perfect way... Let's get some. It's a perfect way to understand the attitude of the era, what they were going for, what they wanted to do as not just a publisher, but these guys are pushing lifestyle. They're pushing young male adults to become a part of the club. Highly important. So, I know you guys thought it was Wildcats number one. It's not. It's Wildcats Adventures because the launch title, which is underneath here, Wildcats, Wildcats gets to Saturday morning cartoons. It gets to a SNES 16-bit video game. It gets to KB Toys. We have, oh, pinned up by Jim Lee. KB Toys. Toys R Us, Kitty City, all sold the Wildcats action figures. Wildcats Adventures number one is the height. It's the absolute height of Wildstorm Productions. Maybe the best concept of Wildstorm Productions is Stormwatch. The Stormwatch as a reading arc. I'm talking 1 through 25, 25 through 50, 50 all the way into volume 2, volume 2 into the Authority 
aka Patterns, Stormwatch. Far more impactful, a better idea, and overall a better read than Wildcats. Wildcats, hey, <laughs> it's not it's not the number one read, but guys, it's close. I love Wildcats one through four. I love everything this bleeds into. Today's original video was Wildcats becoming more of an espionage book with the James Robinson, Chavez Charest run. We're going to highlight that eventually. But Wildcats, number one. Insanely impactful. Insanely good. Great superhero adventure action. Wildcats, number one. We have a side story that Jay Lee draws. In an absolutely legendary way. So a lot, a lot of the subplots here, they show up in Wildcats. Your next few issues will overflow with the Wildcats Monthly. Wildcats Trilogy by the one and only Jay Lee. Some of those subplots are splintered within Wildcats. Grifter runs off and he teams up with Backlash. Backlash leaves Stormwatch right here. But we get the two guys... Are two dudes, the two dudes that we absolutely love, teaming up. This sets Backlash onto his monthly book. Grifter breaks away for a little bit. He's later to return. And during all of that, we get the Killer Instinct crossover. This is Mark Silvestri's Cyberforce crossing over with Jim Lee's Wildcats. Right here. Jim Lee, Mark Silvestri. These guys... Crossover with these guys with a babe in the middle. And who's the babe? The babe is this girl named Misery. Let's see if we can find a picture of her. That's Misery. So we get Wildcats crossing over with Cyberforce for Killer Instinct. This was a delightful read. If you guys need to know a little bit more about Misery, I believe she is their attempt to just do a Jean Grey and Jean Grey starts as a flat out villain. So, during some of that, Warblade and Ripclaw, well, they have their own sabbatical. They both break away from their teams and they go into Endangered Species, where we get a little bit more into the origin of both characters. Most, most into Ripclaw. We get a little bit more into the Demon Knight lore. Uh, this is a lore expanding miniseries. So, Grifter returns to Wildcats, Backlash returns to his solo series. And now he's hunting down his babe. So, this is him breaking into a facility. We have a flashback that is roughly around Stormwatch issue 4. Backlash, he's got to hunt down his girl because she's possessed by demon Demonite. If you guys aren't familiar with the Demonites, the Demonites, they possess people. They take over. Uh, but in his case, the Demonite that possessed his babe took her, like, soul. She's just like a, uh, she's comatose, essentially. So he's he's got to find a Demonite so he can put the, put the consciousness back into his honey. So Jim Lee experiments. Darker Image, a.k.a. Images Heavy Metal Magazine. This is Jim Lee. He, he recruits same Keith. Same Keith brings his own character, the Max. Max is the most popular of any of these premier characters. Rob Liefeld does Blood Wolf. And yeah, it's okay. It's, it's nicely drawn. He does his cable here. And uh, yeah, Blood Wolf doesn't carry on, doesn't resonate. Rob Liefeld still pushes Blood Wolf to this day. But the one character that really popped immediately, it was Jim Lee's death blow drawn in the Frank Miller Sin City style. And that goes into the death blow monthly. Now, Darker Image only had one issue, by the way. I think up to four got solicited. Death blow, issue one. Jim Lee, kind of schizophrenic. He... Roughly does four issues. They're not complete issues. As you can see, we get into Cybernary. Cybernary not connected to the Wildstorm universe at this time. 
Deathblow loosely connected to the Wildstorm universe, but we really can look at the two of them as separate characters at this time. Deathblow later fully gets rolled into the Wildstorm universe, so does Cybernary, and Cybernary predates Deathblow. She's actually the Homage Studios creation. She was a poster that Jim Lee made just to sell his own merchandise. This is, let's just get people working on cool things that we know our fans want to buy. Deathblow rolls into Death Meat. If we want to see a little bit of how much of a character Void is as a power set. If we want to demonstrate how two companies can get together, literally make love, create their own pocket universe, we have Deathblow and uh, we have Deathmate, I'm sorry, and Deathmate is, it's a wonderful, 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 I love Deathmate so much. People bash the hell out of it. I don't know how you can bash, you know, artwork like this. And this is Rob Liefeld in his transitional phase. But this is when Rob Liefeld still cared. He still cared. So with all of these Deathmate one-shots, we get Deathmate Black. This is a nice story, but it's important because we get Gen 13, a.k.a. Gen X. This is their first appearance. Essentially, we end our story with Fairchild inheriting an alternate Earth. Isn't that crazy? They never go back there. So, inside image. I just want to show showcase this because you guys know what's coming. We have Gen X number one. Marvel gives Jim Lee a phone call and says, what are you doing? So Jim Lee says, well, we're doing Gen 13. Gotcha. Gen 13. Immediately sets the industry on fire. This is a part of the bad girl phase. This is the rise of one J. Scott Campbell. J. Scott Campbell still in the game. He's still doing covers. He has a website if, if you're into just buying merchandise. We're into reading comics. But yeah, Gen 13. It's 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 the teenage superhero, but these characters feel like that they fit perfectly in the 90s. No other teen book has ever done that where they're embedded in the time that they come out. Yeah, and Gen 13 sets the industry on fire so much so it gets an animated movie later to be bought by Disney and buried by Disney. That was Jim Lee's second strike. First strike was Wildcats, second strike is the Gen 13 movie. Gen 13 gets Warren Ellis. And Warren Ellis gives us the the dynamic opposite of Gen 13 with DV8. DV8, Deviants. And these characters are the counter to Gen 13. This is a long-running series. It's consistent. It's good. It's great at times. Amazing melodrama. It's a sign of the time. Because we, it does feel like it's from the 90s. Then we have a launch where they do, I think they do 8 alternate covers. Previously, for the monthly, they did 13 Gen 13 covers. This is before every single book on planet Earth had double digit variant covers. It was a big deal. So during all of this, you know, a lot of people re remember this getting solicited. What works? But what works finally drops. And what works immediately, you know, and, and Wells Portacio, uh, you know, like he, this is this is a, a letter of apology because he he was like second to Jim Lee. And Wells, they solicited what works, and he kind of went through family trauma. And this book took forever to come out. I, uh, a lot of people blame this as one of the reasons why the industry collapsed because a lot of retailers spent money to solicit and pay for this and the book never shipped. So what do you do with that money? And that's the major issue with a lot of 90s comics. But these guys, this was a new company. They're figuring things out. Uh, you know, like not quite there, but they had kinks to figure out. And we can kind of see the timing of this is right around the, the Wildcats animated series. 
if you want a good example of how quickly Wetworks rolls into into the Wildstorm universe, well, look, they're right here with Backlash number four with Savage Dragon. And at this time, the Wildcats action figures are dropping. But this is great. Wetworks is here. This is Backlash kind of becoming the Spider-Man at the time of the Wildstorm universe, meaning like all the characters interact with Backlash because he was that popular. Grifter gets his one shot. Steven Seagal, he's one of the, the second gen, as I call it, second gen architects. This is one heck of a one shot. It spins off into a monthly. Unfortunately, Grifter's true number one becomes chapter five of Wildstorm Rising, the first company-wide super crossover. And we have C.C. Steven still writing him. So uh, you, you, you kind of want to say, this is why we don't do company crossovers, right? We don't do company crossovers because it can interrupt a release and a drop. The timing for this was was there. People wanted more Grifter. Grifter was popular. Grifter later gets a quick... He, he goes like a year and then he gets a volume two number one. So within... within you can kind of argue two years. We get a Grifter one shot and two Grif, Grifter... Two different monthly series. All right, so Union, uh, again, is a little bit of this, like, heavy metal idea. They they had access to Mark Tashira, who, if you guys are a fan of the Masters of the Universe comics, you know, I'm talking about the ones with the toys. He he came, he did some of those books. They came pre-packed with the action figures. Union is already folded into. We see that he's, you know, he's fighting Stormwatch here. But it takes Union some time to feel a part of the Wildstorm universe. The Union is also kind of of a allegory for Superman. But at the same time, like, you can kind of argue that Mr. Majestic that later shows up in Wildcats is Superman. And Union is Shazam. I put this at low level importance. <laughs> Just because... The character doesn't fully kick in. z -Lock gets her own miniseries, which really defines her as a Wonder Woman allegory. Which is, like I said, it's, and speaking of Mr. Majestic, he's right here. I'm fine with it. I, this is a good three-issue mini. I love her path. It's, it's kind of like three issues. We have Ron Mars on board. Three issues, and each issue is almost like a a um, like a century that Zelot exists in, uh, leading into Wildcats. This is solid stuff. Divine Right. This is the return of Jim Lee to drawing comics, and we got Lynch, we got Fairchild. Divine Right: The Adventures of Max Faraday immediately gets rolled into to Wildstorm lore. But here's the amazing thing: this guy right here, right between the Taint and the Crotch here, Max Faraday. Max, uh, he becomes a creator and the, an overall god of the Wildstorm universe. Uh, it takes us some time to get there because Jim Lee couldn't keep a schedule at this time. So let's go back to our boy Backlash. Backlash exhausts his monthly book. It goes for about four years. And then it goes to zero. And guess what? Backlash. Still popular. Still popular. He gets his own team. Wildcore, drawn by Backlash's co-creator, Brett Booth. And here it is. Now we have other books at this time, Phantom Guard and Yeah. But we see we see the, the time frame, Divine Right number four. This is it's good stuff. It's just superhero stuff. Look, at the end of the issue, they run into a team of bad superheroes. And this is a lot of Brett Booth's characters, like his ideas, his, his, you see more of Brett Booth in this than you do with Backlash. This book, this book too has one amazing, one amazing Chromium cover. Now, post second <laughs> Wildstorm crossover, Fire from Heaven, the first one was Wildstorm Rising. We have Wildstorm New Horizons. And this was like, this was the beginning of the end, a Wildstorm superhero.
the superhero universe. So speaking of the end, well, we have to just put in Fantastic Four Volume 2, number one. Jim Lee ditches his own company, uh, turns his back on the other founders of Image Comics. Because you have to remember, everyone broke away. Like, let's just kind of talk about this real quick. Like, everyone breaks away and forms Image, right? You have, like, seven guys, and they all take a huge risk. And you want to argue that collectively they're more powerful than not. But also collectively, they have to stay within the image eye. If they break away from the image eye, they diminish everything. And this this is where Tom McFarlane was very right to freak out about this. Tom McFarlane freaks out. Image pretty much ends with Heroes Reborn. Rob Liefeld and Jim Lee. Break away, they take over two separate books of Marvel, but this is the Wildstorm side. One amazing, I mean, I love Fantastic Four Volume 2 issue 1. I love it so much. Look, see guys, I, I tear it up. And then we get, essentially, this is the Iron Man that becomes the ultimate, like, this is the one that becomes ultimate Iron Man that ends up in the movie. This is the groundwork of the Tony Stark that we love. We even see here, like, womanizing, getting a, a drink thrown in his face. And this, effectively, with this, ends. It ends the Wildstorm superhero universe. 